What the heck is blood flow restriction training and why are athletes using it in the Olympics? Did you know that you can use this and this when you do this so that you can get this and then win this? Or at least that is what some Olympians are doing when they compete this year in the Olympics. Listen up everybody, I have some news. Hey interns, I'm Dr. Chris Rayner and I am not your everyday ortho. Today we examine blood flow restriction training, a new technique that some believe will improve the effects of their workouts and training in the weight room. At face value, it presents the opportunity to do less and gain more. Seems like the perfect recipe for the occasional athlete. But with the Olympics now in full swing, it isn't just the weekend warriors that are utilizing this technique. It's this guy and this guy. Okay. At the highest level, the slightest difference in performance could mean the difference between gold and silver, or even a podium position. So it comes as no surprise that these athletes are doing whatever they can to boost their performance and to better their rivals. But what exactly does blood flow restriction training do? Is it legit or even legal for these athletes? What gains are they actually making? And at what cost do they come? If you've ever had your blood pressure taken, then you will know that having your arms squeezed <sighs> At 200 millimeters of mercury for even one minute is not pleasant. So why in the name of bejesus would anyone willingly want to do this to themselves while training? Blood flow restriction training is a technique that has been around for quite some time, although it is only now becoming popular with athletes. It was first utilized in 1966 by a Japanese powerlifter and physician, Yoshiako Sato. He used it for the purpose of muscle hypertrophy for powerlifting. With this technique, a restrictive band or compression cuff is placed around the extremity that is being trained while the athlete performs the exercise. The cuff is inflated to restrict the flow of blood into and out of the muscles being trained. It is used to prevent disuse muscle atrophy and to enhance hypertrophy and strength response in skeletal muscles, particularly in load compromised individuals. Pretty simple, huh? <laughs> Basically, this just means that it can be used in people who are having trouble working out to help them to gain muscle strength and muscle mass. But not so fast. There are a crap ton of variables that make the ideal technique for blood flow restriction training a bit of a moving target. What type of cuff to use? What width of cuff? What pressure should the cuff be inflated to? What is the desired change in blood pressure that is sought? What duration of time should the cuff be applied for? How intensely should the athlete exercise? How long can this technique be used? What application is it useful for? With all of these questions about BFRT, there is just not any consensus on what is the optimal protocol to use. So what exactly does BFRT do? Dr. Sato explains that there are several mechanisms that cause muscle hypertrophy. In other words, there are several ways to make your muscles get bigger. Blood flow restriction improves the recruitment of fast switch muscle fibers, increase the production of growth hormone and insulin growth factor or IGF-1, improves amino acid uptake, increases overall protein synthesis, and decreases myostatin. This type of training creates a novel stimulus for skeletal muscle and induces a positive protein balance, especially for patients with orthopedic disease or injuries, those with disuse syndrome, sarcopenia, and wasting due to severe chronic illness. Is BFRT, also known as katsu, actually a shortcut to getting jacked AF? The research of Dr. Sato and colleagues has focused primarily around the use of BFRT in the rehabilitative setting with injured or post-operative patients or patients who are significantly debilitated and unable to perform regular exercise. Several studies have shown that in those populations of patients, BFRT training in combination with low-level exercise is more effective in building muscle and strength than low-level exercise alone leading to improvements in both strength and muscle mass. However, in those capable of regular exercise and resistance training, it is not more effective than high-level exercise. More recently, it has been used as a performance aid by elite athletes. Its purpose here is to increase muscle strength and endurance. Its mechanism of action is not clearly known, but researchers speculate that it might work by increasing stress on muscle cells, which may promote muscle development. However, to be honest, we really don't know how it works in this population because to date, there have not been extensive reports or studies. In that case, why should athletes even bother? Why not just train normally? 
While BFRT has not yet been shown to be more effective than high level training, it has been shown to be more effective in the setting of injury and recovery. An athlete using BFRT can use these findings to their advantage. They can use this type of training to allow them to increase training volume without also increasing the overall load on their bodies. While minimizing wear and tear, they can make use of the time that would normally be required for rest and recovery after training hard. In some ways, BFRT could almost function like a time machine, giving the athlete back time to help them better prepare for the task at hand. The athlete could also use this type of training to allow them to continue to train when injured so that they don't lose precious training time and more importantly the gains that they have achieved prior to becoming injured. It could prevent the atrophy or muscle loss that is normally associated with injury and might avoid the loss of strength that occurs with inactivity. In this way it serves as a bridge between injury and wellness. But really what everybody wants to know is it a freaking performance aid? Well the jury is out on that one. This is being studied now and we will have to await the results of these studies before we know this answer. Personally, I don't think that it is a performance enhancer in the same fashion as an anabolic steroid or blood doping. Which leads to the next question. Is this shit even legal for athletes? Since this technique does not add outright performance for the athlete, it is different than the performance enhancers mentioned above. With it, you're not adding anything that is foreign to the body to create something that was not already there. Rather, you are taking a process that normally occurs in the body and tweaking it so that you can have the body continue to work when it otherwise couldn't no, or no, no, wouldn't. No, no. In that no. sense, it is not performance enhancing, but more like loss preventing. So for now, it is legal. Is it ethical? I don't know. You tell me, what do you think? But all of that aside, are the gains even worth it? At the Olympics, where the difference between gold and silver can be mere milliseconds or fractions of a pound, every single advantage is important. What might be trivial to the average person or weekend warrior becomes critical for the athlete performing at the pinnacle of performance. Every tool or technique that is not directly contraindicated in the rule books is a potential avenue for success and an opportunity awaiting to be exploited. So from that sense, it is worth it. But what about physically? Is there a price to be paid for all these micro gains? As with any intervention, there are associated risks that might make the sticker price a little steep for most people. BFRT has been shown to affect heart rate and blood pressure. It can also cause hypotension syncope and may play a role in the development of blood clots in the extremities, the production of reactive oxygen radicals, and even the breakdown of skeletal muscle tissue with subsequent development of rhabdomyolysis if not performed properly using the appropriate guidelines. Cause like, it's a little hard to win a race on the track if you have to drag a kidney dialysis machine behind you. Seriously, although it appears to be a relatively benign technique to use, it is not without risk and the gains are largely incremental in nature. There is still no consensus on what is the optimal, most safe manner in which to utilize this technique. Consequently, although it is gaining in popularity, it still may not quite be ready for prime time usage and is likely most appropriately used in a monitored setting under the guidance of a qualified health professional. And no, your gym buddy and your garage do not count as a professional or a monitored setting, yo. Should you do it? Bruh. Unless you're lining up for the 100 meter finals in the Olympics, then it is not necessary unless you are significantly injured, recovering from surgery, or you are substantially debilitated as a result of some kind of systemic illness. For most people, you're better off just working out for real. Thanks for watching. I will see you for rounds next week. And as always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho. Look, just a flesh wound.